All right, so I am going to talk a little bit about expert elicitations um, from a slightly different perspective from David, mainly because David actually studies this. I mean, so I go to talks from people like David to learn a little bit about what's going on with expert elicitations. So my experience is from actually kind of being an, an economist or a decision scientist and performing expert elicitations in order to get answers that I'm interested in. Um, and so, you know, some of the things I'll defer to, to David and some things I'll just give you my practical experience, um, which may be interesting if you're interested in doing these kind of things. And then I'm going to talk about how we, or there's a different ways, I'm going to mainly talk about my experience of taking elicitations and then using them in a model to answer some specific questions, just to kind of give an example of how you can do these things. Um, and so this was kind of where we left it last time, and again, there was all this theoretical work, and we said, you know, what happens as the um, uncertainty around climate, climate damages increases, and it turns out it's ambiguous. We don't know whether we should abate more or abate less. And, you know, as the uncertainty around um, the outcomes of R&D increases, we don't know whether we should invest more or invest less. So the theoretical work kind of didn't run into a dead end. We, we got some insights from it and so on, but it kind of has gone as far as it can go. And we need to go a little bit farther to get some answers. And so that's, that's where I got interested in trying to actually collect some data. And so my focus is not on the climate uncertainty, but my focus has really been on the, um, the technology uncertainty. So what I'd like to know specifically, I want to think about R&D portfolios. And so I'd really like to know is how does an investment in R&D, if you make an investment in R&D, what's the probability of getting a particular technological outcome? And so that's the question that I'm interested in. Um, and so, oh, and so expert elicitations, actually we haven't really entirely defined it. So an expert elicitation is a formal method for eliciting these, you know, subjective probabilities from experts. Okay, so it's, you know, it's basically asking experts for their probabilities, but as you saw from David, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. You kind of, you prepare them. So it's a, it's a formal method so that it has some regularity to it. And so when it came to thinking about this R&D problem, so I wanted to know if the U.S. invests money in an R&D program, what's the probability of the various outcomes? So I decided to use elicitations. And so I'm just wondering if you guys can think about it for a minute. Why, why would I want to use expert elicitations in this case versus any other type of data? Or can you think of some other types of data you might want to use and then what the limitations of those. So, I mean, if you wanted to know how R&D was going to affect technological outcomes, what would you use? Uh-huh. You could look into the past and see past behavior. Right. Then the drawback of that is that, of course, a past R&D does not mean, I mean, past uh, behavior is not representative of, of what can happen in the future because all the information we have now and the um, prospective that we have Right, that's what, for, for technological change in particular, especially when we're thinking of things like, like a breakthrough, discovering a new molecule, it's just not clear that in the past, you know, whether you didn't find the molecule, you know, it's not clear how much data you get from the past just because you haven't had a breakthrough. Uh, a mix. So, right, okay, so you could use, right, right. So market data, right. So that, that would be another, so market data. So like you would look at how, so if companies are currently investing, you would look at how investors respond to the companies that are investing in one particular technology versus another. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So market. So you could probably, you could, to some degree, use market values if there are, you know, if we think we have a, a pretty well working market, and if they're they're working in the right technologies. Yes, we prove that the market overreacts to any investments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Typically, they overreact. They don't react in a proper way to. So, so the market value of firms and their say uh, patents portfolio, they they're not exactly. For biotechnology, or IT technology, so I suspect 
Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And that's, that's all talk. Yeah. I mean, I think that's an interesting point because we're going to talk a little bit about elicitations. And you really only want to use elicitations where you don't have much other option. And so for how, once you kind of have a technology with some kind of a cost, how that cost evolves through time, that seems to be pretty regular. And so you, you might want to use past data for that. But for, for specific, especially if you're looking at a portfolio. And so you also might be able to use past data to see, in general, the efficacy of government R&D spending. Although I haven't seen anybody ever been able to figure out how to do that very well. But in theory, you, you could potentially do that. But it still is not going to tell us whether I should invest in purely organic solar sales. right? And you, looking at the past history of solar doesn't tell me whether I should invest in purely organic solar cells. because. Regardless of how successful or lack of success you've had in silicon solar cells, it really doesn't tell us much about whether we're going to be able to find the right molecule to make a successful purely organic solar cell. Uh -huh. Right. Well, so I don't know if we have, I mean, that's the thing is, do we have, we have absolutely no idea. It's, it's hard to say, but we would like to make decisions about R&D. And so it's useful to try to get the information we can get. And so in, in this particular case, because of the, the, the one, because of like breakthroughs, that just because you haven't had a breakthrough or you've had a breakthrough, that doesn't really tell you about the future. And two, in particular, is the difference between the different technologies. Just because one technology has followed a certain path in the past, there's no reason to think that a different technology would follow that. Um, because of those things, past data is not super useful in differentiating um, R&D over technologies. And so we're kind of forced to use elicitations. You can do them in different forms. So you could use the real market, or there are these um, prediction markets. I mean, you could try to use a prediction market. But a prediction market, in some sense, is it's I consider kind of an elicitation. I mean, it's, it's an indirect elicitation, right, if you use a prediction market. Um, but the idea is that we, we, we don't have much except for the information that is in people's heads who really understand these technologies and what it would take to get a breakthrough. And so because of that, um, we decided to use uh, elicitations. Um, and so that's for this. So, but we can think of other types of data where maybe you do or maybe you don't. And so like we might think about oil prices. So say you, know, you have a, a model and you, in your model, you would like to have a probability distribution over oil prices in the future. And so we can, how, how might you come up with probability distributions over oil prices in the future? I guess people haven't thought about it very much. But in, in that case, you might think that past data is telling us something at least somewhat relevant for the future, right? I mean, the past and the future are still different, but we have a lot of data on oil, and we have the, the variability of, of oil prices. And so it seems like that, at least, is telling us something. It gives us an idea of kind of how much it tends to fluctuate. We, we've kind of seen how things have changed or not changed. And so in that case, rather than just doing a pure expert elicitation, you might want to look at past data. What else could you look at besides past data? No. Uh -huh. Well, R&D spending, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying oil prices. So we just want to think about how oil prices might change in the future. Uh huh. You could apply the modeling model and predict the oil price given the model ahead of the market. Right, right. I mean, energy modeling in general, right? I mean, there's there's lots of energy models out there, and oil price is an economic variable, and so we we have some understanding of how it relates to to other things, and so it's not it, it's a little different from this technological change. We have we have models that tell us things, that as oil gets more scarce, we would expect the price to go up. As the economy you know, gets more active, we expect the price to go up. I mean, we, we 
again, technical change is not independent from oil prices, right? You think a little bit about technological change, but there's a, a little more information. So getting back, I like this idea about using market data. Mm -hmm. I think that in the case of new technologies, that's not going to be very useful. However, most of these companies that get angel funding from some sort of startup, there's typically are companies that come in and give seed money to startup companies. Mm -hmm. and if you can get information about who, which bets are being placed on which technology, mm -hmm. Yeah, it might not be publicly available. And until recently, actually, those angel investors are not particularly great either. So I'm not sure. Um, I mean, my understanding of angel investors until very recently is they base it almost entirely on the personality of the person who's running the firm. That's both. I mean, I saw that in a panel of angel investors, and so that's what they all told us. And then I just read that recently, that until, until recently, Google just got into it, and Google decided to apply data to it. But until recently, the angel investors actually it was just like, was this person interesting, dynamic, and smart, and they'd invest in the person, less in the idea. So it's not clear that that would actually tell you about the, the R&D. But it's, I mean, I think things like, it's reasonable to try to think of things like they that. They do have meetings, though. These guys have meetings where, where, where uh, technology guys come and hawk their wares and try to get money from them. I mean, right, right. But it's the guy who comes to hawk his ware. Yeah, exactly. It's not the technology. It's, the, it's how good of a, how impressive that person is. I mean, that, that's what it, until recently, that's what it's been. And, and so... Uh, but anyway, but the point here is that some things you really kind of need elicitations. Other things are a little more arguable, and you, you probably could get some data with it. And so Bill Nordhaus isn't here because he is doing this study, and they had three pieces of information they wanted. And originally, they wanted to do elicitations on all of them. And um, I think it was probably me partly. I was like, uh, like if you don't have to, <laughs> don't do an elicitation. So he's cut it back where the three pieces of data they're doing population in the future. They're now just going to go to Yasa, who's got all kinds of different models and stuff, and use Yasa's projections. Um, I think for um, productivity growth, they're going to, is it productivity growth? Yeah. No, no, which they're, one? They're no, they're going to do an elicitation on productivity yeah. growth. And then a climate sensitivity, they decided to look back at a whole bunch of different um, estimates on climate sensitivity and somehow put those together rather than doing an elicitation. And so it's, the point being is that different, you don't, just because something's uncertain, some people get really excited about elicitations and they want to run out and do an elicitation on everything that's uncertain. And um, you don't necessarily have to do that. And I guess we want to think about, <laughs> so why don't we want to do an elicitation? And you've started to see a little bit from what David was saying, right? It's because people are not great at actually, I don't know if it's coming up with their subjective probability or, or getting, I mean, it's not really clear, but they're, they're not great at coming up with these subjective probability assessments and that they make some systematic errors. And so since we know they make these systematic errors, if you can avoid that in some way, then, then it's nice. Um, and so I was going to talk a little bit about, um, yeah, about some of these things. And so I don't know how much we're going to overlap, but this is just in general, why not use elicitations? And I use the kind of old... Kahneman and Tversky, this biases and, and heuristics, right? So that people have, it's just the way that people seem to think, right? There's ways that human beings think, and I guess they're useful most of the time. I mean, this is the theory, right? That they evolve because they're useful most of the time in the world, but they tend to cause some particular problems when you're coming up with um, trying to make these, these judgments. And so just as an example, we did the one thing we did yesterday, okay? or two days ago. So you guys did that, and you were, basically I was asking you for subjective probabilities. Now I didn't, I just threw them out to you guys, right? In a real case, you would talk to people and so on, but I just threw them out to you. And so you guys had your probability distributions. So now let's think about this. So, so what's a surprise, right? Um, uh, I would say you'd be surprised, right, if, if you did your probability distribution and you said <laughs> you thought the probability that Cuba had more than a million people was 1%. And then it turned out that it had more than a million people, right? You'd be kind of surprised because you said you thought that was only a 1 in 100 chance, right? So we had, it, it turned out, even though not everybody answered every question, we had about 400 um, different people did these probability distributions. Okay, so if everybody was well calibrated, and so now I don't need to explain too much what well calibrated means, if you guys were all very well calibrated, and we had um, 400 probability distributions, then how many surprises would you expect? Where surprise is either, you know, that it turns out to be below the one percentile or above the 99 percentile? 
right? So how many would you expect if you were well calibrated? That's just a probability question, right? Um, so out of 400, a little, eight, right? Right, so about 2% of the time, we'd expect some, the answer to either be below the one or above the 99, right? We've got 400 questions, so we'd expect eight on average. Okay, does that make sense? We expect about eight surprises. Uh huh. Well, that's if we were weathermen and you asked us about weather. You asked us about two uh, No, no, I said if you were well calibrated. Right, right, no. If you were well calibrated, that's what we would expect. We would expect about eight surprises. And this argument we can't be well calibrated. Right, right. So, then, so that's my next question is then, so that's what we would expect, right? So if you were well calibrated, what do you think that we actually found? I'm just curious, how, how many do you think out of these 400, we'd expect about eight to be surprises, about how many surprises do you think we actually found? So how many, so we're not weathermen, what do you think? Okay, so you think about 40. Any other guesses, how many? Valentin thinks maybe more. How many, what do you think out of? 80. So maybe 80 surprises. Okay, so I have, I think, See. 139. <laughs> okay, so we'd expect eight, and then people thinking about expected maybe 40, maybe 80, but 139, so about one third. So if each of you, most of you didn't put your names on them, so I don't think we have them back. But if you got yours back, about a third of your answers would have been in the, the surprise category. So what's happening? So what, I mean, first of all, what, how did your probability distributions look versus how they should have looked if they would have been well calibrated? Were they, you know, are they too skinny? Are they too wide? What? Right, they're, they're, they're far too skinny. And so what's, what's going on? Why did you make them so skinny? Any sense? Yeah, it's, it's, so it's overconfidence, right? And it's very interesting because all of you are saying, like, you don't know anything about this, right? You're like, what? I don't know anything. So it's interesting that even though you don't know anything, you actually, you thought you knew more than you did because you scrunched it, you scrunched it down too much. Uh-huh. Is it because we, when you get, like, certain questions, what is the population of Cuba, then you just have one number in your head. Mm -hmm. Right, that's certainly one of the, the theories, and that seems like a pretty obvious one. And actually, how many people started that way when you, when you had the questions? How many of you started by thinking approximately what it was and writing down your 50th percentile? Because that's, I mean, that's the most natural way to do it. Um, and that, so that's anchor and adjusting. So that's a very, seems to be a very typical human way to do things, is that you think, you know, you kind of think through, you're like, oh, you know. You come up with a number, and then you kind of spread it out. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And I would argue it's always possible to assign numbers to something, but to do the calculus or the probability calculus in my head, that's, that's really impossible. When you ask me for below 1%, then I, I think of something that is really, really, really unlikely, but not impossible. Otherwise, I would have put the number zero, let's say, because then I'm, that's when I'm very, very sure. Mm -hmm. and, and isn't that just an argument that subjectively you cannot assign probability? So what we assign, you simply cannot interpret. Right, so I mean, you certainly can assign probabilities because you guys all did. So your question is how meaningful yeah, are those probabilities? Probabilities, I'd say uh, it's, it's some number, but not something you should read as a probability. In particular, when I see this, I, it's, it's just something. You ask for something that you call a probability, and I just try to do something, but to interpret it as a probability would be, it's, it's just too much. So what would it take for you to interpret it as a probability? Other than being, being able to show that it has a property or probability function. But would you say that this probability is what we have in mind when we try to assign them? I would say that there is a problem in terms of mathematical understanding of this procedure that is not so easy. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, when I thought again about the experiment, I started to think, oh, maybe I should put some, some extremely large numbers. Of course, it means I'm feeding it to the upper end mm -hmm. because I really don't know what are the orders of mm -hmm. the Right. So, I mean, so you could potentially be miscalibrated on the other direction, right? So you could have no surprises. I mean, in, in 20, that wouldn't be too surprising. But say you did 400, 
you might be so, you know, you might never get any surprises, in which case you're still miscalibrated, you'd be underconfident. But it turns out that people are very typically overconfident. Uh -huh. Do you know, I mean, because we gave multiple probability points, mm -hmm. um, are people more miscalibrated for the extreme tails or for the, like, 75-25? Like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't look at it, so actually I don't even know. Do you know what? Yeah, the answer is yes. It's a little form of yeah. Okay. yeah, the surprises are, are harder. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And especially because we're asking for 1 and 99. But even if it was 10 and 90. I mean, my understanding is that people will give almost the same answer for the extreme question you ask them, whether you ask them for 1 and 99 or 10 and 90 or 30 and 70. I mean, that, that's, that's what I've heard, that they, they give kind of similar answers. So, so, I mean, this is a problem. And so this is why we're not crazy about elicitations. But there are things that you can do um, to... You know, so I just threw that out to you, right? There are ways you can do elicitations to try to um, get around some of these, these problems. So I do have another experiment um, here. OK, so on this one, all I want you to do is, so hand this out. Go ahead, here, you don't have to take one, but. Were we any better in the questions about the group? Oh, I should have checked. You know what? I didn't, I forgot, because I didn't grade it myself, and so I forgot to ask that. Yeah, and the idea is, so that one, those one questions where it was about the group, actually, I should have looked that there, you should be somehow better, although you didn't know each other particularly well at this time. But because you know each other, you have a little bit more information, you should be better at that. And so it's interesting to see whether you're more or less overconfident on those. And actually, I didn't, I didn't check that, though. Right, they're bounded. Right, right. But bounded, it helps a little bit, but it doesn't help that much. So in this one, what I want you to do, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I can't read it very well. But here's the answers, but if you're, if you're interested. <laughs> um, we can post that later. But here, what I want you to do now is I just want you to estimate the number of rooms in the MGN Grand Hotel in Las Vegas. Oh, there should have been. Oh, only one each. Year. Yeah, only one. Everybody take one. One, 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 one. Oops, yeah, that was a mistake. Sorry, everybody should only take one. <laughs> and that might actually throw it off, but anyway. Um, so. The MGM Grand is a hotel in Las Vegas, and all I want you to do, you don't have to do a full elicitation, just write down your median. What do you think is your median for the number of rooms? Do you think there's a 50-50 chance that the hotel has more rooms or less rooms? Okay, so just a, just a quick elicitation. No talking to the person next to you. <laughs> no talking, no talking. OK, so did you do it? OK, so everybody now just trade with the person next to you just to make sure we get unbiased answers. If, if you're done, write it down, trade with the person next to you. And then we'll just quickly write down our answers and see what we can come up with. So what I want to do now is go through the room. and if, if So trade with somebody next to you, and then you're going to give me their answer. So if you're sheet has an A on it, then just tell me what your answer is. So, who are you? Okay. It doesn't matter. I mean, I just want to get the answers. Okay. So who has an A? So just start yelling out numbers. Okay. What's yours? 800. Okay. How about another person? 400. Okay. 4,000. 4,000. 400. 400? Okay. Okay. Those are two thousands, I think. Three one thousands, okay. Five hundred. A five hundred. Okay. Okay, on an A. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There shouldn't be too many more, right? How much? Seven hundred. Okay. Okay, I think that should be about all the A's. So now with the B's, let me know what those numbers are. Start coming. There is a, there is a 16 A. Sorry. Oh, okay. Well, let's just do this. So, so 2,500? Okay. B's? 600. 600? Okay. 1,000 and a 500? 800. An 800? Twice. What was your? Twice? Okay. 
1700 okay <laughs> any more bees okay that's a little hard to tell. I don't know if we can add these up really quick and average them. A thousand? Yeah. And okay. That's okay. But these ones, the 5,000, 4,500s are in the A? 60? This one is B? Yeah. yeah, I thought that seems seem more likely to be B. Okay, so I don't know, can you can anybody add those up real quick in your head? They're not quite as a They're not quite as different as I thought. I'm still kind of suspicious of this five thousand that somebody might have peeked at the, the B. Uh huh. What? People saw that. Yeah, that's a problem as people saw. But so normally what would happen, and I think it probably would happen at least a little bit, is if you add up these, on average, we'll get something around, I mean, it's hard to say, so we have a 4,000 and a 5,000 there. So otherwise, let's see. So still, you're going to get an average of maybe around 1,000? An average of 800? Yeah, so anyway, round, say, 1,000. And this one, so again, a little hard to tell, but, well, we definitely have a lot more over 1,000, and so you're going to get a higher average, and usually it's a bigger difference. And so what happened is that the two, you, know, but you guys kind of saw them, you weren't supposed to, I should have been more careful, um, that they had two different, um, well, anchors, right? So they gave you some information, and that's, you know, and it's not unreasonable, I guess, to take that as information, but it, it was fairly arbitrary. It just told you it had more than 50 rooms or less than 5,000 rooms. And so what happened is when you saw the 50, you anchored on a lower number in general. And when you see the 5,000, you anchor on a higher number. And so you'll typically get different average numbers from these. So, you know, this one you could say, well, it gave you some information, although obviously not very much since both of these statements are true, right? And it only has, I forget how many rooms, it's got somewhere in between this, I think 2,500 rooms or something like that. Um, but this, it's, what's interesting about this is this happens even when the person knows a number is totally random, they still will anchor on it. And that's why I think it's most interesting. If I had a spinner up here, I would spin a spinner, it would land on 1,200, then I would ask you how many rooms are in MGM Grand, you guys would tend to center around 1,200. Whereas if I spun the spinner and it landed on 10,000, you guys would have guessed a really much larger number, and so it's an interesting so 12, phenomenon. 1200, 1200 for first and okay, so we had a difference, not as much as I would actually expect to see. Yeah, I think I'm. Yeah, I think it's about 2,500 rooms, 2,500 rooms. I don't know. I actually don't know. I just got this from somebody else. Yeah. It's a big, it's a big hotel. <laughs> okay, so that's a. Um, okay, so it's a, it's these biases, and so we do have a number of biases: the overconfidence, the anchor and adjusting. You you anchor on various things, and then you just uh huh. Oh, so maybe I missed. It might have been a typo. That's I think actually I think that probably the B should have been fifty thousand. It might have been a typo actually. But the point is, is that you get different. You get these different answers. But that is here. You're definitely not going to be very well calibrated if I give you the wrong data. Right, right, right. Right, right. So that's also Right, right. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you would like, you'd ultimately like your expert to be an expert, right? And so, 
it doesn't really make sense to ask, again, some random European about the size of an MGM hotel. I mean, that would be just not a very good data to draw from. So you would like experts. Um, so I mean, there are things you can do with both overconfidence and anchor and adjusting. So a simple thing you can do is you can start with the extremes rather than starting with the middle. Now, of course, a lot of people, nevertheless, will say, even if you say, what's the one percentile? They're like, well, I think it's about 100. You know, They still, in their head, often will anchor, but you can try doing that. You can explain overconfidence. That helps a little bit. You can, you can talk. You can try to get them to think about things. So if, they, if you say your one percentile for the MGM Grand, whatever, was you know, 5,000, then you can say, well, let's just pretend for a moment that there were 50,000 you know, rooms. Can you imagine a hotel with 50,000 rooms? You know, and people will start to think, and they're like, well, like, I guess maybe it could, you know, or, or they say, like, Tom's like, oh, it's engineeringly impossible or whatever, you know, but, <laughs> but you can think it through and think about, is it possible? And so then sometimes then people will revisit and, and spread things out. Uh -huh. Can you see that the that you were discussing that as economists and one of the kind of approach that this, that's been given, it's also what it did a couple days ago, that you try to do, do kind of the math. Does that Yeah, I think that'd, that'd be more a question for David. I mean, are there? Because how do you have different approaches to assessing this probability? Do you see different results? Yeah, that I don't I mean, what do you, David, you'd know more about that. So this has actually become a very popular thing in psychology now, me measuring people's numeracy, which are scales of how, numeracy is like literacy, but about numbers. And, and I don't think there would be much of a difference between people who are ex well-trained economists and, you know, trained psychologists, but I think if you think of the overall population, the answer is yes, there are differences. So people show, for example, that you know, in the context of medical decision making, when you explain to people result of genetic tests, side effect, you know, probability of side effects of taking medication or doing various uh, operations, that people who are highly numerate are they better are able to extract much more information and they make better decisions about this thing than people who are low on the scale. The depressing thing is that medical physicians are not very high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, 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 but, but yeah, but there are differences. But I don't. I think that what you're making, the decisions you're making, was probably very close to the high end of the scale, and probably it would be much different. Yeah, I have a, huh? So I have a story that's, that's directly related to this, even though it's a bit seems a little like digression. When we were kids, we used to take uh, road trips. throw the kids in the back of the car. And my brother and I and my sister would always be playing. So we used to play games. And one of the games we'd play, whenever we'd go by, at that time, McDonald's was just getting started. And every year we'd go to the, they put a sign uh, on more, more hamburgers sold. First summer, two <laughs> million. Next one, eight million. My mother from this, we're from a family of engineers. <laughs> eight, eight of the family that my brother's uncles and they went to Cornell engineering. It's like all engineers. And so my mother, who's an industrial psychologist, developed a test <laughs> for whether or not you're an engineer. <laughs> on the summer vacations, my, my, we, we asked my dad, OK, McDonald's sold 8 million hamburgers. Is that enough to go to the moon? <laughs> and so your answer to that question tells you whether you're an engineer or not. <laughs> and it's also an indication that you're a good GE modeler as well. <laughs> so what's the answer? Yeah, no, no, no. So it's not that by anchoring you get better. It's that anchoring is a problem. And so we actually, as the, as the non-experts, we like, if possible, to not anchor the experts. But it's often very challenging 
to not. Yeah, but at the same time, you provide information in order to. Okay, maybe this is a mm. bad example, but just to help me start, if you provide information in order to invite biases, you do provide information. Provide. Remember that you are, uh, that there's generally bias in Oh, biases. right. We tell them that kind of information. Yeah. But we don't tell them anything about okay. purely organic solar cells because. They know about purely organic solar cells, but I know supposedly, I mean, from learning from David, I can tell them a little bit about the psychology of this kind of thing. So we tell them that. We try to avoid anchoring. I'll, in a minute, I'll talk about different ways of eliciting some, which anchor more than the others. Um, sometimes you also anchor the answer by using, um, yeah, specific way of, of the language there. How do you, how do you, how do you um, pose the question, for example? You don't have to use numbers or Right. Right. So I mean, one thing you can do is you ask the same question in different ways at different times, and actually trying to. You often one of the things you do when you're when you're doing elicitations is you try to actually get people. So so Dave was saying it's a problem if they don't um, if they're not coherent. But actually, you try to elicit incoherence in some ways, because then that gets the person to think very deeply. Then you're like, hmm, when we ask it this way, you said this. When we ask it that way, you said that. Now let's go back and, and you know, think really deeply about how you actually feel about this. And so you try to sometimes ask them multiple ways. I mean, some of these things. Um, I don't, yeah, that I don't know. I mean, maybe, you know, there, there's, there's these indirect methods, which are more like games and, and that kind of thing. But as I can also talk a little bit about, so there's all these different biases and heuristics, which Dave has talked about a couple of them. Um, what I wanted to point out, which I thought was kind of interesting, is this motivational bias. Um, and so this is what Tom was getting with weather forecast results. It turns out they're not very motivational. But the, the bigger one is more like a salesman, right? So a salesman might say, Mm, I think we're only going to sell a million dollars this year. And then he comes back and he actually sells $2 million. And so he's like, oh, I should get a really big bonus. I sold twice as much as we predicted, right? That's an actual purposeful motivational bias. When I present these elicitations, especially to economists, they go crazy. They, they, they're like, the motivational bias is what economists totally pick on. So I don't know what it is about like, your economics training. You think everybody is going to have a motivational bias. And they're very, very concerned about motivational bias. Like in R&D, right? They're concerned that people are going to try to give an answer, which is going to get their technology a higher investment. And you know, it makes some sense. But I have to say, in my experience, especially with doing these face-to-face -face ones, you know, unless they're all <laughs> really, really good liars or whatever, you know, that I don't find that much at all. In my experience with doing this, I found one person who very clearly had a motivational bias because his answers were just so. Um, it was like, okay, if you invest a million dollars, what's the probability? 0.02. If you invest five million dollars, what's the probability? 0.98. And you know, and it, and it wasn't like they had a story that for one million you couldn't buy what you wanted. Five, you know, he. I mean, so that's pretty clearly motivational, right? He's saying a small investment got you nothing, a large investment gets you there for sure. And so that kind of makes sense that if you plug that into the model, that there's a good chance you'll get that higher investment. But in general, I, I didn't, with these scientists, I don't find it at all. They're very honest, even about their own technologies. I mean, <laughs> they, get, I mean they give low probability. I mean, they give all kinds of different probabilities. The other thing about motivational bias in our problem, the portfolio problem, is, is other than that, if, if you ask them two different levels and they give you that, it's actually not obvious what answer will get you more money, right? Do you give a high probability, low probability? You know, it's not actually clear. Because if you're giving a really high probability, then it's saying this thing is actually maybe kind of easy to do. And maybe we don't have to invest in it. If you give a low, you know, it's not really clear what the motivation would be. But anyway, I just think it's interesting. Whenever I present these, especially in economics conferences, they're like, oh, everybody's just going to lie to try to get more money for their program. But I don't actually find that, I just have to say. Uh -huh. But there's a way around it, and that is to, proper, to, to strictly proper scoring. In other words, mm -hmm. you set up a payoff function, a feedback function that is such that you maximize it if and only if your responses are honest mm -hmm. and not if you are biased. So, I, but I don't understand. How does that work if the payoff is 50 years from now? If the outcome is 50 uh, years no, from no, now? No, the payoff is immediate. I mean, the outcome is 50 oh, years okay, from now. The, the outcome is 
long, long yeah, I've never understood how that worked, if the person's going to be dead or whatever when you find out. Okay, so that, I mean, because I've heard that and I'm like, that sounds fine if you're running an experiment. It doesn't seem to work so well when we want outcomes that are 20, 30, 50 years from now. So that's why, why we don't have that. If the outcome actually happens, if, if, if your outcome happens in the future, but our outcomes, it's R&D, and not only that, it's conditional on the government spending a certain amount. And so you, you, many times we're not even going to be able to tell if their answers are right or wrong because the government's going to spend a different amount from what we conditioned it on. Right, right. So is it, yeah, it's not, is it the technology, is it the investment? So these are just some ways that you can get better. And so practice, so that's what we see. The weathermen are very, very good because they do it all the time. Um, awareness of heuristics and biases, I think, I guess there's some evidence that it has some effect. Um, and then there's assessment techniques, these thought experiments, high estimates, multiple ways. So a lot of things we talked about. Decomposing a problem into smaller problems sometimes helps people to think about them. Um, and then what we always do is you ask multiple experts and average their answers. And so you hope to, you know, individuals are going to have different biases. Um, there is some, uh, David was talking about, the, there's some people who mathematically adjust. So when we know there's certain regular biases, you can ask questions in certain ways and then you can adjust them to try to get a better answer. Um, and then, yeah, this is this cook. I don't know what you think about this cook. He does this skills testing. He asks similar questions where the answer is known, and then he says, how good are they? And then he uses that to weigh the real one. My problem again with that is that it's not obvious what kind of question that's known is going to tell you if a person is good at telling you whether a technological breakthrough is going to happen over the next 20 years. And so it's, and I don't think he's ever shown that. He asks 10 questions that are all similar to each other and shows if you're good on nine of them, then you're good on the 10th. But I don't know what kind of question to ask in mind. But anyway, these are, these are some, some ways you can do this. Um, and so, yeah, so then when should you use elicitations? I guess my answer for when you should use elicitations is, is really only when you don't have another good choice. So that's, I would be very careful about using elicitations. If you have any other way to try to, it's reasonable to try to derive a probability distribution, you might want to use that way other than elicitations because they're, they're also, oh my god, they are very time consuming. So they, it's, you know, collecting data and analyzing data and stuff is way easier than trying to organize these solicitations. But, uh, you know, so they are useful. I think sometimes if we want information, I think they're the only choice. If they're the only choice, then I think you should do them. But if you have other choices, I do recommend that you go for those other choices. Um, and so then these are very, uh, very brief, but kind of in my experience, the kind of <laughs> two, the two key ways, and this is what David was saying, that you can either ask for, um, ask for the value, you know, give them probabilities and ask for the value. So that's what I gave you guys. So you ask for a low, high, low, and median. And so this is an example of one of our questions. What's the lowest energy penalty you can envision for a specific technology in 2025 under some conditions we gave them? And then we tell them specifically, we're looking for a value that's efficiently low, but you think there's only a 1 in 20 chance that the actual energy panel will try to be lower. So this is an actual question that we asked experts. So we gave them the probability, and we asked them for the value. On the other hand, you can choose values and ask for probabilities of those values. And so this is an example from a different elicitation that I did. What's the probability that a capture technology will be developed that can blah, 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 with the parasitic energy loss of 10% of loss, and they would give us that probability. Um, everything must be defined to pass the clarity test. That was what David was saying about being unambiguous. You have to make sure it's unambiguous. Um, and so with these, actually, I don't even know. I have my own ideas about these, um, which you might know a little bit more about. In my experience, and I've talked to a few people, overconfidence seems to be worse in that top one, when you ask for the low, medium, and high, you tend to get more overconfidence. On the other hand, the second one, um, you're, you're anchoring, <laughs> right? I mean, we, so you're saying that we're deciding on the anchor in some sense. I mean, we tend to develop it with the experts, but we are giving them an anchor. And what can happen on that second one, too, is depending on what predetermined questions you ask, 
you may not get much of the distribution. You may end up getting just something, a little teeny piece of the distribution. Um, so, so to me, which I haven't actually quite done this yet, but to me, I think we'd want to combine these two things. You'd want to do some combination of both of these so that you can kind of try to get around overconfidence, try to get around anchoring to some degree. You can still get the tails and, and so on. So anyway, these are just some, some practical experiences on doing these elicitations. So now I'm going to talk about implementing the data. Any more questions? And I, I guess David will be back. Well, you're going to talk probably more about communicating uncertainty, I think, next time. But uh -huh. any, any evidence that if you just explain to them this anchoring effects and the various fallacies that can go wrong, that you can improve? Well, so people certainly do it. Is there, is there evidence that that's helpful? I, I haven't gotten that clear. But that you explain these, these systematic mistakes that people make, that they tend to make fewer of those mistakes. Yes, probably not as powerful and as consistent as you would hope. The margins, yes. Yeah. In some cases. So it helps a little bit. Yeah. It doesn't help nearly as much as we'd like, but it helps a little bit. So we do it. So you explain it, you give them examples. The, the MGM example is one that we actually use right in an elicitation to just show people about anchoring and, we, and that kind of thing. And I guess there's, there's some evidence it helps, but it doesn't help as much as we would like it to. All these things are good, but they're not great. That's what a, at Snowmass last year, Detloff. Von Winterfeld, who I think is one of the best people at doing elicitations, he still showed when he asked a bunch of people some question about nuclear power, the experts, their, their probability distributions basically didn't overlap. So we had a whole bunch of experts and their distributions didn't overlap, meaning that they, at least all except for one of them, at least were overconfident, right? They all had way too skinny. They should have all overlapped. And he's really, really good at this, and yet he wasn't able to get them to stretch out their probability distributions. And so, you know, that's... That's where we are. It's a particular hard probability problem of eliciting probability of extreme probability, extremely low. So, you know, when you get to the 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the minus 6, very few people can make this distinction. This can work at a, at a different scale, but when you go to the tail, if you think of the NASA example, where they, you know, I can't remember which one, the first shot of the explosion, miscommunication of what I see. Mm. The danger was 10 to the minus 4 or to the, to the 10 to the minus 6. And so that's, that's exactly where it gets extremely complicated. All right, so then I was going to talk a little bit about, so we want to think about R&D. We don't think there's any other good data, so we collect this elicitation data and now talking a little bit about implementing it. And so we, um, well, first of all, there's different things you can do with it. What, what Bill Nordhaus is doing is really just a descriptive, um, he just wants to do it descriptively. He just wants to say, here's the probabilistic inputs, Let's put them in the models and see what our outputs look like, how uncertain our outputs are. So that's one thing you can do with it. Um, with Valentina and, and I and Laura diaz Adidan, and I guess uh, you are doing, is trying to actually use this to support decision making. Um, so I was going to actually very briefly, so I use a kind of multi-model approach where I use other models. And actually, Tom, I was just going to ask you just to clarify. You said you thought everybody should build their own model. And I was wondering, do you mean this is purely for pedagogic reasons? So to, if you're going to live in the IAM world, that you should build a model so you understand what goes into it? Or do you think that every time so everyone has a question, they should build a model to answer that question? <laughs> Just you curious. Know, you get fresher insights if you build your own model. Okay, so you do think they should. Okay, because I, I, mean, I, I generally think that you should think about it, and there's a lot of models out there that are pretty powerful and consider building on an existing model or using existing models. Well, you Yeah. That is, in the problem, in, in, at least it's less of a problem in the IAM world, but in the CGA world, the tenants for people to use models where they never really look at what's in the model. Right, right. Just put the numbers in and hit go. And right, and then they'd say an that, answer. That's, that's the motivation. Right, right. But I guess it's just a balance between in building your own model. And also, I find with some students, like, they, they want to build a model, and, they, and they're building their model, and you're kind of like, what questions do you want to ask? <laughs> you know, and, you know, so why are you building this model? And, are you sure you couldn't use dice or why, you know, there might be good reasons for not using dice, for instance, but, but you want to think about it a, a little bit carefully about, do you really need to build a new model? Can you build on a model? Can you use a model? Can you adapt it? But there are reasons. I mean, there's obviously path dependence on these models and they start to look like Frankenstein, right? Because you start with a model that's meant to do one thing and somebody adds this to do something else and you add that and then you have this model that wasn't really made for your question. And so in that case, maybe you do want to start fresh. But I don't start, well, we build a very simple model, but we mostly build on models that already exist. So I take a different approach. Um, 
And so these are some of the examples. So out of Harvard, um, Diaz Anadon et al. wrote a, a report, Transforming U.S. Energy Innovation. I have a project I'll talk about. Um, Val actually, I don't have Valentina. Valentina has a project that's working on this. And then Valentina and Laura and I are doing this team project. And then Nordhaus has a little bit of a project. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about this one just because it's another example. And so if you're interested in this, you, you might want to look at this. So this is, they, they did a large, very large project with a lot of technologies. They performed elicitations, they did models, and they came up with policy recommendations. And this is a slide I stole from them, so I don't exactly know what everything stands for on this slide. But basically, they wanted to attach R&D funding to the cost of technologies. And to do that, they performed expert elicitations. I don't know what the six dimensions are. I know they did business as usual funding. Each expert said their recommended level of funding. And then they asked them for half their recommended or 10 times their recommended. Do you know what those six dimensions are? That's, I mean, it doesn't really matter. I'm not quite sure what that means. And then, so they, they had these different funding trajectories and then they were trying to do costs. So they'd say, what will the levelized cost of electricity be? Or I'm not, I think, did they ask for levelized costs, right? We asked that, no, they asked oh yeah, they did. They asked for like, what would the efficiency be and what would the cost of, manuf or the um, cost per watt peak be or something like that. They would get elicitations. Then they would take the, these endpoints that you get, so the cost per watt peak and the efficiency and so on, and they plug those into a Markel model to get economic outcomes. So they look at all different combinations of these things and get outcomes. Then they did this method where they built a response surface that would go from R&D funding to economic outcomes. Um, and then I have a slide on this, but um, I'm actually not gonna go into too much detail about it. In there, so they used elicitations so they did a couple things. They had a lot of experts, but what they did is they didn't combine multiple experts. They just chose a representative expert, which is interesting. So you're going to talk a little bit about combining experts next to what time. So they only chose one expert instead of the, so they have information on a wide range of experts, but they chose one to model. And second, their actual eventual model was, was not probabilistic, but was deterministic. So they, their R&D response function was actually just using expected values ultimately. So they, they did these elicitations, but they ended up doing it deterministically. Um, and so then, this is a project that we're working on right now with Valentina's elicitations, my elicitations, and Laura's, and then ultimately there's a few other elicitations out there as well. We want to harmonize these different elicitations because right now they're completely different. They're very hard to compare to each other. We want to harmonize them, aggregate those, and see what we learn from kind of the whole group of people doing elicitations. Then um, our method here, so, so we're going to aggregate elicitations. So now we have probability distributions over the levelized cost of solar, say, given a certain level of funding. We're doing something we're calling um, covering distributions. So we're looking at all the distributions we have on levelized cost of solar. And we basically look at kind of the very smallest levelized cost and the largest levelized cost. And we pick a whole bunch of points between those two. A thousand points. We have a thousand points that go between the lowest and the highest. We take those thousand points and we run them through three different integrated assessment models. The GCAM, Markel, and WITCH. And so then we'll end up with 1,000 output points, right? Whatever it is we care about, GDP, cost of stabilization, and that kind of thing. So then we'll have 1,000 output points. And so then we're going to post-process to get probability distributions over those 1,000 outputs. So we're going to take our probabilities from our elicitations and assign them to the 1,000 outputs. The reason we're doing this is for computational efficiency. So instead of like running... Monte Carlo, every time we want to compare, say, say we want to look at what happens if you have a low investment in solar and a high investment in nuclear and a medium investment in, in biofuels or something like that. So that's one particular set of probability distributions. We could run a Monte Carlo or something like that on that. Then we could rerun it again on a different combination. But this way, we run the models a total of 1,000 times, and then we can apply different probability distributions to those 1,000 points to get a sense of what the different R&D portfolios. So that's our... We're in the middle of doing that right now. I guess that's going to come out, what, a year from now or something like that in, in the energy policy? 
So harmonize. So that's um, so like for one thing, my elicitations are for what will happen in 2050, and Valentina's are for what would happen in 2030. So we use a method to kind of a, a learning curve type method, basically, to move the endpoints from, in this case, 2050 to 2030. So all kinds of million, zillion things like that. It's, um, it's a really complicated, but that's so the idea. In the model, it knows these, these technologies exist, and what's the mechanism in the model for adopting Is it just that you describe the technologies? In other words, what? Right. So they're all, yeah, these, these technologies all exist in these models in um, GCAM. So it's, you know, carbon capture, solar, all those kind of things. So the, the technologies exist. These are giving the values for the parameters of these technologies. So that's basically all it's doing. It's deterministic. Right. So, so each time, yes, so the models do it. They run a thousand times. Each one of those thousand runs is completely deterministic. And that gives you a point. And so, you know, you're like, if solar is here and nuclear is there and bio is here and blah, 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 here's the cost of stabilization and here's your GDP and here's all the different things you so care that's about. That's why when the stuff is available, it's part of the elicitation. You put the money in and you'll get the Yeah. So the elicitations it does, and we've gone round and round what to do modeling-wise. And I think right now we decided to do it Monte Carlo-like, or right, where the models, we pretend like this is the cost of solar and nuclear and everything starting from day one. We talked about... And we may in the future try to fix everything for the first 20 years because we won't really these technologies won't come out for 20 years. Um, but that's we kind of are just trying to right now we just want to get some results so that's what we're doing. Um, but we definitely talk about that. I mean, in my my interest is kind of if you're you have to be stuck with where we are now because we won't know about these technologies for a while. So it's interesting to see how that works. But anyway, that's it interacts with the damage curve and like what's available, all the stuff sort of the value. Of the Right. Having the stuff in 2020 may not matter, but that at some point, the cost of carbon gets high enough that it's very valuable to have it. Right. It may not be that valuable for 2060. Yeah, yeah. But knowing it's there, the cost of value is enormous. Right, right, yeah. Yep, yeah, so that's that. And so, I you don't know how much time I have. Um, so then I was going to go through an example of, of what I've done. Um, I have a couple different models. And so, first, I was going to start, this is kind of related to what Bill was talking about yesterday decision science and just how you think about um, a model. So this is kind of my paradigm, if I can get this thing to work or not. Does that work? <laughs> no, I don't see anything. OK. Um, would this one work? Oh, it's, that's right. I'm using this. So how do you get the light to work? Do you know? Which one is the pointer? Right here. Oh, OK. OK. So this is an influence diagram, which is a very specific way of modeling things visually in decision analysis. It has a lot of rules associated with it, actually. But the, on, in decision diagram, the square nodes represent a decision point. And so here, this is how much to invest in which technologies. My decision maker is a social planner. I mean, maybe you could think of it it's kind of like the, the US DOE, say. Okay, so I have a decision maker. This is their key near-term decision is how much to invest in which energy technologies. The oval nodes represent uncertainties. And so this means for any given technology, we don't know what its characteristics are going to be in the future. So I have technical success. We don't know whether the efficiency will be above or below 15%. Um, so this is an uncertainty. The arrow here means something very specific. It means that, that I believe that the probability distribution over the technical characteristics depends on how much we invest in which technologies. Okay, so the probability distributions kind of in this node are conditional on what we invest in over here. Okay, so that's, that's what I believe. Um, the double-lined one means that I model this relationship as a deterministic relationship. So I say, if you tell me exactly which technologies are in the economy, then I can estimate how much it costs to reduce emissions. Okay? And that's what this modeling thing is, right? If you, you tell GCAM what the technologies are, it will tell me what the cost of abatement is um, for different levels of abatement and in different years. Um, here's another uncertainty. This means that I'm uncertain about the damages from climate change. And so this one doesn't have any arrows coming into it. This is just an exogenous uncertainty. And then this is my key second stage decision, which is how much to reduce emissions. 
And the arrows here mean that in this framework, I'm assuming that I'm going to know more about, I'm going to know the cost of abatement, and I'm going to know the damages from climate change. And then finally, we're trying to optimize something like minimize societal cost, the cost of abatement, the damages, and the investment in R&D. Okay, so this is an act, learn, act framework, okay, which, is, which is important. So again, we were talking about learn, then act, act, then learn. So we act, we invest in R&D, we learn, and then we act again. Okay, so it's an op, kind of an option value type framework. So this is the framework that I'm interested in. Um, and so, so this is so what I would like to do is, you know, put in the probability distributions in the data and roll this back, right? A dynamic program or stochastic program, roll it back and say, what's the optimal R&D portfolio? But when we started this, there were some huge holes. So we knew <clears throat> basically nothing about how R&D affect the probability of success when I started this program. And we didn't really know too much about how technical success affected the entire abatement cost curve. And so the first step in this was trying to fill in these pieces of data. And so I got funding from the DOE to do this. <clears throat> and so what we did is we started by performing our expert elicitations. We talked to the scientists and engineers who work on the technologies <clears throat> to, um, <clears throat> to connect, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> So we did the elicitations <clears throat> to try to connect R&D investment <laughs> with possible outcomes. So that was the first step. Sorry. And then we, um, I can move it ahead if you want. And then <clears throat> we took these, so we, we had specific outcomes that we assessed probabilities for. So again, like an efficiency of 15%, a lifetime of 20 years, and a cost to manufacture of $50 per meter squared. So we took those particular definitions and plugged them into what was then Minicam, which is now GCAM, and we derived marginal abatement cost curves. So again, each one was deterministic. We had marginal abatement cost curve based on a specific set of technologies being successful. Then we can combine those marginal abatement cost curves with the probabilities, and we get probability distributions over marginal abatement cost curves. And then that's what we use to do our next step of our work. And so I'll go over this kind of briefly. I, this is just the technologies we're doing. We did for each technology, like for carbon capture, we did three sub-technologies, in this case, pre-combustion, chemical looping, and post-combustion. So for the different technologies, we didn't break them down. You know, we broke them down to a certain degree, not all the way down to like the smallest level that you could. Um, and then this is an example, again, of the kind of definition. So pre-combustion. Success was parasitic energy loss of less than 10% and incremental <laughs> capital cost on top of IGCC of no more than 10% of the cost of IGCC. So that was our definition of success. What you see over here is how we translated this into um, Minicam. These are the actual parameters that go into Minicam that are related to these definitions of success. And then here's an example of the, one of the outcomes. So what I'm showing here is for CCS, so we didn't, talk to a lot of experts, in this case only four experts, so I don't know what David's going to say about the number of experts we need to talk to. I read one report that said that the marginal value of experts after three or four actually goes down quite a bit. So we talked to four because it's a pain in the neck, I can tell you. So um, we talked to four experts, and these four experts in CCS happen to really divide into optimists and pessimists. And so what I'm showing here are the optimists and the pessimists. So the black are the optimists and the red is the pessimists. And so our optimist for post-combustion thinks that, you know, for these different investments in it, it's almost certainly going to achieve the goal that we set for it, whereas the, op the pessimists, you know, think it's down more around 50%. Um, for chemical looping, you know, these guys are very optimistic, and down here it's close to zero. And for pre-combustion, again, fairly close to zero and a little bit higher. So, so they're very different. So again, the question is, so what's happening? So on the one hand, people are always worried, oh, you need to sample more, and you might not kind of cover the whole sample. So I feel like we're covering a pretty wide sample here, right? That I don't think we're missing anything in, in some sense. But, you know, how, I don't know, how, how valuable is it? Because there's really, really big disagreements here. And so, you know, I, I don't really, I don't know exactly, but it's, it's like kind of this is what we have. This seems to be, at least right now, 
It's the information that you have, so you go ahead and you make, you average these and you make decisions with it. But there, you know, there's some question when you have some of these that are just so wildly off. Well, you can't, you have to evaluate the consequence. In other words, if even for the optimists, it doesn't pay. Right, right. The return is, then you found a piece of information that's useful. Right, right. Yeah, and I actually haven't done as enough of that as I should. We mean to do that, to do sensitivity analysis over the individual um, experts. I did a little bit of that. I do have a paper in, that's that environmental modeling and assessment where we calculated the value, we call it the value of better information. It was, the, it was like we assumed that one of our experts was correct, um, but we don't know which one. It was what would be the value of knowing which expert was correct. So it kind of got at that. And there was, in some cases, there was a lot of value. In some cases, there wasn't. The, the, the answers didn't change very much. And so it was, it's, well, you'll see in a minute, it's fairly robust. Um, this is just an example where I compared mine. They had actually already done a study. The National Academy did a study on CCS, and so we compared ours with theirs. They did um, a no DOE funding uh, trajectory and a, a with funding trajectory. And that's actually a really important point I want to make. In our first elicitations, we didn't do a no funding case. We only did cases with R&D funding. And I think now that that is a big mistake. I think you definitely should always start with a baseline. What would happen if the government didn't do R&D funding? Right, because it's not, it's, it's not impossible that you're gonna have a breakthrough just because the government doesn't do R&D funding. And so you've gotta be, I, I don't think we were careful enough about that. So in my next elicitations, we made sure to ask, if there's no funding in R&D, what do you get? Now if there's funding in R&D, what do you get? Is there any empirical evidence about R&D funding for the labs Right, right. So, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've worked with Greg Nemet, and he's, he'd be a good person to answer something like that. And we don't really know. There's not, it's, it's so hard to get evidence about private R&D, period, that it's hard to know exactly what's happening. I mean, people argue both ways. Certainly our experts often seem to argue the other way, that if governments invest in something, Firms take that as a signal, and they get excited, and they invest more. So, so, so it, it could be a complement to private investment, or it could be a substitute, right? The firms are like, oh, the government's investing in this. We don't need to invest in it. Yeah, just my reaction sometimes looking at the lab sometimes do crazy stuff that's clear that the industry would never do. Yeah. They, they, like I saw a presentation about nuclear fuel, the redesign of the of stuff related to nuclear. I was thinking Westinghouse would certainly be interested in that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Right, right. And so it seems like certain things they do are things that would directly crowd out. In other words, right, right. So that's why, yeah, you want to get to the zero. So if the government didn't invest at all, if you already have really high success, then the government doesn't need to invest in that. And so, so that's we didn't do that, and we probably should have. I'm going to skip through these. These are just some other results. Um, these are just what we found. The experts gave us these very, very low R&D budgets, which was kind of interesting. What what they were doing is like in solar, they're like, they're like, ah, there's only 10 guys in the US who can do this work, you know? And so, <laughs> so they like doubled and said, let's assume we're gonna invest in 20 labs. Because there's no point in investing in more than 20 labs. And so they gave us these very small numbers for R&D, which is interesting. Again, it's, I don't know if that's what you would think with the motivational bias or not, right? So they certainly, they did not say, oh, you better give solar $100 billion a year or you're getting nowhere. They were like, Oh, $2 million, you know, $2 million a year, or maybe it was like $10 million a year. They were literally saying $10 million a year in a particular thing would be enough. So they gave us very low amounts, and I don't know what I need to do to try to work on that. These, these didn't include development. They didn't include you know, development projects. This was purely for scientific um, research I was interested in. Um, we often saw optimists and pessimists. Um, the disagreement over cost targets is actually something that's interesting. So we did, you know, what will be the cost to produce solar cells, you know, um, uh, a cost for per meter square to produce solar cells. And so we got these big disagreements, and by talking to them, they were actually disagreements about kind of economics and whether the government had to invest and, and um, production and learning by doing and stuff. And so we decided that actually wasn't a good question to be asking these scientists, right? This, it, it's, it wasn't really the right question. We could actually model that pretty well. But in the same, so we, we decided to try to not ask cost questions, but then that becomes really, really difficult. So you wanna ask something. You need to ask something about what kind of materials and so on, and then build up the cost model yourself. But it, it turns out 
So we did that on our second one, but it turned out to be really complicated. So anyway, just something to, to think about. Um, so I'm probably out of time here. I've got a couple of minutes. So we, um, let me just skip to the, this one. So then what we did is we, again, we took these, we plugged them into Minicam, and we derived marginal abatement cost curves from Minicam. And so for those of you who are modelers, we did it, you do it kind of backwards. You set a carbon tax at like $150, and then you see how much abatement you get. We get, you know, 36% abatement, and so that makes that point on the marginal abatement cost curve. So it's a kind of an approximation of a marginal abatement cost curve. So we derive these marginal abatement cost curves. The black one is the baseline assumptions in Minicam. Pink is um, an improvement in purely organic solar cells. Orange is chemical looping, which is a carbon capture technology. Green is uh, advanced light water reactors, nuclear. And then the gray is if all three of those are successful. These are the marginal abatement cost curves, right? So we're saying, what's the cost to abate one more ton of carbon? So it's a learning going on that here's the cost. Because your R&D tells you what the cost right. to get the first one built, or the, the feasibility of building one. Right. So. Well, the costs that we derived were supposed to be once it's in, like, once it's widely developed. And so, anyway, it was a little bit confusing about that whole learning thing, and we need to work on that a little bit. Their costs do change in GCAM just because they do, and they don't, they don't have fixed costs across time. They have learning, and so they would put some assumptions about how you would get here. But what we thought was interesting was kind of what I was talking about the last time, how different technologies affect the marginal abatement cost curve in different ways, and especially what you see is CCS has, you know, not surprisingly, no effect at low abatement, but has a pretty significant effect at high abatement. And so we, we, mod, we end up modeling that is that CCS kind of pivots the marginal abatement cost curve down around zero. So kind of the way we often model technical change, it's a, it's a, a proportional reduction of the marginal abatement cost curve. But nuclear is different. Nuclear has an impact on the marginal abatement cost curve, right? It, even if there was no carbon tax, if you had a much better nuclear technology and it was socially acceptable, you would reduce your emissions for no cost, right? You wouldn't have to have a carbon tax to reduce emissions using nuclear. So it, it has a, moves over here, but at least in GCAM, it doesn't have quite the same effect at high abatement, and it has to do with, I think, with the social acceptability of nuclear and how quickly it can move into the, um, into the economy. So we model nuclear as a mix of a shift. It shifts the whole curve over and a little bit of a pivot. So there's both a shift and a pivot there. But anyway, that's how we end up modeling it is through shifting and pivoting. And so we take each of these and we estimate a shift parameter and a pivot parameter to say how the technology affects it. And so, um, so actually, I'm going to just skip. This is an early one we did, but I'm going to skip it and go on to our next one, where we then took this and we plugged it into the DICE model using two-stage two stochastic nonlinear programming. Um, we, again, here's the cost curve in DICE, and then we, if we have technical change, it's represented through alpha one is CCS, alpha two is actually solar and nuclear because they have similar impacts on the marginal abatement cost curve. And this is the pivot term and this is the shift term. And then the rest of this is just dice, except for this here. This is our investment in, in R&D. Um, we did it like Nordhaus. We looked at different scenarios, Kyoto or whatever, based on ones that Nordhaus did. Just try to get to it quick. And then we did it under different mean-preserving spreads in the climate damages. And so the one result we found, which we thought was interesting, was our optimal overall optimal portfolio was very robust to a number of different things. So what I'm showing here is the, the total amount of the R&D portfolio in millions of dollars. Um, and then here, this is showing increasing risk as we move in this direction. This is when the damages are certain. This is when the damages have a, um, I think it's a 30% chance of being three times higher. And a, is that right? A one-third chance of being three times higher and a two-thirds chance of being zero. So it's a mean preserving spread. And this is a 1 20th chance of being 20 times higher and a 1920 chance of being zero. So we're getting riskier as you move to the right. The green line shows the optimal R&D investment under the stern, um, a stern policy and under a two degree limit. The blue line is the optimal R&D uh, investment under the DICE optimal, the Gore policy, and the Kyoto strong. 
And the reason these are together is because they came out to be the same. And so what we see here is even though you see this here, but this is a pretty small difference in, in a lot of ways, right? That the optimal portfolio was super robust. And it's particularly interesting because the DICE policy and the Gore policy, I don't know if you guys are familiar with them, are very, very different policies. And so it was very interesting that you actually came up with the same um, optimal R&D portfolio and that it was pretty robust um, in increases in, in risk. Um, and, and I'm going to ask something. So the link two degrees is a, uh, 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 it's just the constraint. dice optimal. Yeah, it's the dice optimal with one constraint. You can't go above two degrees. Okay, and then you also consider the damages from that, but you don't really care about the damages at that point. Um, right, because in dice it would go slightly above two degrees. So, yeah. So it cares about the damages. You don't care in a sense because you are always at two degrees, so right. the damages are always the same. Right. I, yeah, I don't know exactly. Yeah, once you hit that point. Okay. But it's just, it's just these. But anyway, I thought it was interesting. And we think there's two reasons for this. One is the fact that we do have these elicitations. And it turns out that the technologies are fairly differentiated. Some are inexpensive and have high probabilities and high impact if they're successful. And some are expensive and have low probabilities and low impact if they're successful. So they're very differentiated. There's like a big gap between kind of the two sets of technologies. And so different things like the policy and the the um, damage uncertainty, it doesn't really change very much because they're actually so differentiated. And then there's another reason, which I may or may not have time to get to, but did you have a question? Just quickly, so the higher the risk, the lower the investment. Right, so that, so when you stretch out the tail in particular, so if you have a mean preserving spread that stretches out the tail, then this is a pretty robust thing, that the in, optimal investment in R&D goes down. And the reason is, is that, Techno energy technology R&D, what it does is it reduces the cost of abatement. So it only affects basically the cost of reducing emissions. Once you get to a certain level of damages, I don't know where it is, somewhere between the 5 and the 10, in DICE you abate fully. You have 100% abatement when the damages are that high. It's optimal to abate 100%. And so once you get to this level over here, then your technology is benefiting you as much as it's going to benefit you, right? It's going to reduce your cost some certain amount. As you stretch the tail over, what's happening is you're just getting a smaller and smaller probability of being in a world where you will abate fully and where your technology does you any good. So the farther you stretch that tail out, the less beneficial it is to invest in R&D. And that, that's pretty... So it doesn't always decrease in all increases in risks. But, but I showed in another paper, it will always decrease in this, this stretching the tail increase in risk. So there's other increases in risk where it won't decrease. So that's a, so if, if you want just one more thing, the, another reason why it's robust, that which I think is it's my favorite result, so I'm going to skip through these. Um, yeah. So, okay, so what I'm showing here now on the top, this is temperature. And it ranges from 2025 to about 2200 for the, the DICE optimal uh, policy and the Stern policy. And what happens is that there's just one temperature path up to 2050, and then we diverge because it's stochastic programming. So these are all the possible other ones. So these all have probabilities associated with them. Okay, so it's the DICE optimal and the Stern. So what we see with temperature, with dice, oh, and, and the only uncertainty here is not damages. There's only uncertainty in the outcomes of technical change. So we've invested in technology. We're, we're uncertain about the outcomes. And so depending on the outcomes of technology, we have different paths. So in dice, if we're very successful and all of our technology is successful, we abate a lot more and we have lower temperatures. And if in dice we're not successful, nothing works out, we're still increasing our temperature in 2200 for the DICE optimal portfolio. Whereas in Stern, because the Stern, um, Stern has very high abatement. I don't know, is everyone somewhat familiar with Stern? Stern has very high abatement. And so the technology doesn't actually have a huge impact on how much you abate. And so it doesn't have a big impact on the temperature. The temperature is just low in Stern. And so we see that technology has a big impact on the temperature in DICE, a small one in Stern. If you go to the bottom, this is the total cost of abatement. We see the opposite picture. In DICE, 
whether you have success in technology or not, doesn't affect the optimal, the, the total abatement cost much. And in fact, um, the highest line here is actually where you have the most success in technologies. We have a lot of breakthrough. We therefore abate a whole bunch. And our total cost is actually a little bit higher. Okay, whereas on Stern, again, your abatement's kind of fixed. And so um, if you, if you don't have success in technology, it's really, really expensive to do Stern. If you have a lot of success, it's, it's not so ex expensive. And so technology has a big effect on the cost in Stern and not in Dice. So we think this is another reason we're getting a very robust answer, is that technology plays a role in both of these different policies. It just plays a very different role in the different policies. So sometimes technology has what I call an environmental side effect. We end up cooler if we get an environmental break, if we get a technological breakthrough. Other times, technology has a purely cost effect. We end up richer, I guess, if our technologies work out. But it has a big effect on both of these uh, policies just in a different way. And we think that's part of the reason we're getting very robust um, R&D technology <laughs> portfolios. So I'm out of time. <laughs> well, Stern, you always have the technology of shifting off the lights. It's always that technology that's always there. Always, so the thing is, in Stern, you're going to be doing that no matter what. Uh -huh. So the, the, the technology cost is strictly from our Just you're, be, you're basically on the same temperature. I think so. Right, right. I mean, it's that, yeah. I mean, there, there's always something you can do. I mean, you, you can do Stern. It's just expensive. But if we have these beautiful breakthroughs in nuclear and solar, now we can do Stern. It doesn't cost us nearly as much. But Stern is not a quantitative policy. It's still uh, uh, cost benefit with yes. high damages, right? Yes. It's a very high damage world where it's always Right. So specifically in Nordhaus, Stern is you find the optimal policy at a very, um, what is it, very low interest rate. You take a very, very low discount rate. You find the optimal policy in DICE. But then you evaluate it at the regular dice policy. That, that's how so Nordhaus. Still, uh, right. Uh, it's still responding. That's why you do see some, I mean, you see some response here. There's some response, yeah. All right. So thank you, everyone. And I will let you go for lunch. <laughs>